All right. My mic on? Everybody can hear me? Cool. <laughs> All right, thanks for joining us here at the MatchesFashion.com lounge at Freeze. I'm Gian DeLeon, the editorial director at High Stability, a sneaker fashion and lifestyle site that was uh, founded maybe 14 years ago. And today I am moderating a panel with these three illustrious guests talking about the interesting relationship between sneakers and the luxury market and how it's evolved over time and our mutual shared pasts in uh, the sneaker world and also aspiring to the luxury world. And so uh, I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists. First, we have stylist Aleli May coming to us from L.A., who also just dropped a, recently dropped a, her latest Jordan collab. So you might have to go on the aftermarket for that now, right? <laughs> we also have uh, stylist Matthew Henson joining us as well, who's styled for a bunch of great publications. You just had a GQ cover, right? Yes. There you go. Yeah. Flex. Right, right. <laughs> and we have Danny Bowen of Mission Chinese Food. Hi. Recently just opened his latest restaurant in Bushwick. So visit that one and the one in uh, Chinatown. It's really good, especially if you like spicy food. Yeah. Mm. So definitely uh, worth checking that Everyone out. Everyone feels like spicy food right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It takes the edge off, you know? <laughs> All right, so lately this first question will start with you, uh, especially with your past working at boutiques like RSVP Gallery and also Vuitton, right? So I just want to know about what the first sort of luxury sneaker you really liked was. The first luxury sneaker whoo, that I liked. Oh, man. It had to be like a pair of Chanel trainers. I remember like there's this one campaign that they have and she's just wearing like a gray sweatsuit with a bunch of Chanel uh, belts and it's super vintage. Um, I think right before Chanel Sport started and she's just like running and I'm just like, that's what I want to look like, you know, right. just something that mixes like that high end and low end. And, um, you know, Chanel, I feel like for young women as well as older women is just like the epitome of, you know, womanhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Matthew, what about you? Um, for me, I would have to say Prada, um, probably the Prada America's Cup. Mm -hmm. um, I was lucky enough to grow up in a family where everyone was pretty much stylish. And I used to look at all my older cousins, and they all had the products of America's Cup. So it was only right that I got them as well. Right. Yeah. And Danny? Um, you know, I grew up loathing after. I really wanted to get, I, I don't know, and this isn't a really a luxury sneaker, but I guess it is now. I think that the first sneaker I got, I have, to, I have two answers to two questions. Right. The first one is, um, Jordan 11s, like, which I don't think is a luxury sneaker. Well, that, that would no, be the next question. Yeah. Most so. iconic, and I like, got that um, when I was a student at James Beard Awards one year, which is like the, the food awards thing. And uh, at that event, like everyone's always very dressed up, and I wore like a baby blue suit and then 11s. But I think the first pair of shoes I also, which isn't really a luxury sneaker per se, but I think it is, is the Yeezy one, like the first Yeezy, um, the turtle dubs. I got the oh yeah, you had the three fifties. Yeah. But I was not. I was like stupid and went to Flight Club and paid like too much money <laughs> because it was just something. I was like, wow, like, and I thought that was so at the time really groundbreaking that like something could go on, up for a couple hundred bucks and then go for a thousand dollars. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that that would be outside of that. I mean, um, you know, I think the first luxury luxury sneakers. I like the Vetmont um, Reebok. Collab, like oh, nice. the crazy white one that was taken apart and put back together. Like. Mm -hmm. Well, you brought up a great point, too, because, I mean, for me, you know, I mean, the first luxury sneaker I bought was probably a Prada America's Cup, but, you know, at, at the same time, and lately you can definitely speak to this, like growing up, a pair of Jordans yes. or a pair of, like, really nice Adidas felt like a luxury when I was in high school, right? I mean, right. I had to mow the lawn, like, for three months <laughs> to, like, right, afford right. one half of the pair. Yeah. So, you know, to me, it's like, I feel like for our generation, Growing up, it was like a pair of $200, $200 pair of shoes that felt culturally significant for us was also aspirational in a way. And Alele, having worked with Jordan now on three silhouettes, like, yeah. what does it feel like? Yeah, a dream come true. I mean, today I'm still like, I'm three in. Right. Didn't even know I could attain one. Um, because I, I grew up in South Central Los Angeles and, you know, having Jordans, it's like if you came to school with the newest Jordans, you were automatically cool, you know? Right. Um, even basically more like 
Air Forces and Jordans. That was kind of just like what my neighborhood wore. Um, but my uncle actually always bought me Jordans, even before I really like understood the culture of Jordan. Right. And then by the time I got to you know school, it was like regular for you to see you know kids with, and we all pull up with the same shoe. Um, and I think that really shows you like. Yeah, working hard and being able to buy you a nice pair of shoes that are going to go with so many outfits. It, it's, you know, that's a luxury within itself to have a pair of shoes, you right. know. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the great thing about Jordans is it always highlights something special that Michael did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's always a story with it. And then when you buy it, you add on your story. So I think it's really just about the foundation of the sneaker. For sure. Matthew, anything you wanted to add about that? Well, she took everything I was going to say. But, <laughs> um, I mean, nowadays it's more about the feeling. Like, luxury yeah. is now a feeling. It's not right. necessarily about attaining that $2,000 sneaker because everyone is wearing it. It's more about how you feel when you wear mm -hmm. what you're wearing, whether it's an Air Force One, which is, yeah. again, it's a luxury to have yeah. brand name things. So right. mm -hmm. it's like a feeling. It's what you make of it. Mm -hmm. Well, and then I think another thing Alayli touched on, right, is with your project in Jordan. It's like shoes are also a medium for telling stories, right? Yeah. Whether you're a luxury brand or a sportswear label like uh, going back to your first Jordan collab yeah. right it had the corduroy and satin there's a yes. family story yes. it's also elevation story um, and you know can you explain a bit about how the sort of narrative that goes behind the, the design or um, the way a shoe looks right shoes have nicknames now right and how that deepens our desire and connection yeah. to them, whether it's like a from a sportswear brand or a luxury label. Yeah, um, I think, you know, when it has a story attached, it makes it much more relatable to someone. Um, and also, if you can't relate to it, it kind of shows you something new. So um, with my first pair of Jordans, I dedicated it to Los Angeles. So, you know, city that raised me. Right. And um, growing up in South Central, uh, my dad and my uncle and a lot of people like him used to wear these corduroy slippers that you would get from the flea market. They're literally like $5. Um, but, you know, it was kind of like lo South Central's uniform. Right. So it was the khakis with chucks with these corduroy slippers and then kind of like Kings and Raiders, like merch, basically. And um, I kind of like took all of that and put it into a shoe because, you know, I felt like LA has never had a Jordan and I wanted to, you know, resemble not only women, but also men in Los Angeles or people who relate to it. Mm -hmm. um, and also people who see, you know, they love details. Right. Um, and I think I wanted to just incorporate different materials and, you know, kind of show you this luxe street edge. For sure. And Matthew, you know, ASAP Rocky worked with Under Armour on a shoe that was that really pulled from several different subcultures. You had skating, you had club culture, and, uh, you know, you had the athletic aspect. So, you know, with a project like that, what kind of story was being told in a new way? Um, I think it's interesting um, because I think at first glance that everyone looked what looked at that shoe and, and thought immediately it was a skate shoe, but it was more about the culture that uh, surrounds not just skate, but like street culture. Um, and how that borrows from all different cultures. So I think that, you know, looking at it right in front of you, it looks like a skate shoe. But it's a shoe that kids wore at raves, too. So that has nothing to do with skate. It's right. like a cultural thing. It's like a blend of different references that he always refers back to, things that he's experienced into one shoe, which is really great. Yeah. So, you know, it's things that have a second life. And so, yeah. Danny, growing up, was that ever a story that got you into sneakers? Was, like, not so much, you know, that it was worn on the court or worn by a specific athlete, but might have been worn by someone in music or another sort of uh, artist that really reinterpreted it in his or her own way. Kind of. I mean, I think I grew up, my parents, oh my god, I, the worst nightmare you could ever have. My parents bought me like imitation like, like oh, yeah. sneakers. <laughs> yeah. And like now it's like, I re remember that was really funny how like that Costco shoe, like, like I don't know who. The Kirkland that. Signatures? Yeah, which yeah. was insane. But like that was literally the shoe I grew up and had to wear. And so like, I think that for me, a lot of my the drive was to be like the other kids that would pull up to school like wearing like you know the new Jordans and like and whatever else and I feel like that there was like that desire to like feel cool and fit in and, like you know and like yeah. mm -hmm. felt like I could jump higher like I really did buy into like all the stuff that was right. being told to me as a young kid yeah but um I think for me the motivation to like and of course when I bought the Jordans when I was like 30 I was like I'm that like old dad wearing like, Jordans you know right and, like um but like I think it was just like it was it was like the cool thing to have and it was mm -hmm. like 
I also kind of wanting to level up from where I was. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Well, you know, speaking of luxury sneakers and, and the notion of value, right, that you guys all brought up, you know, do you think coming from a childhood where you couldn't get, you know, you were wearing the imitation Jordans or you were wearing, like, it wasn't the Pradas, that when you were actually able to obtain it, you were really able to value it more because you understand what it was like to be on the other side of being like, I can't wait till I can get these in my closet. I think that's when... I mean, most sneakerheads, you know, start off that way with always wanting certain sneakers when they were younger and they couldn't get it. Right. And then having the opportunity to be able to buy something, whether it's old or new or re-released, um, I think all those kind of highlights more on like a personal level, like what's your relation to this shoe? And I think that's really what makes like the whole sneaker conversation start is, um, Again, like individual stories and then tying it with, you know, whatever silhouette it is. Right. Matthew? I forget what you asked. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, you know, now that you can afford and like you have like a lot of great both um, regular, both sportswear sneakers and luxury sneakers in your closet, mm -hmm. coming from a world where you couldn't like get the luxury sneakers, now that you can, you're like, you know, you value it more. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I was... I was probably like 12 years old when I had my first job because I'm from a small town in Jersey. If your parents said you could work, you get right. working papers and you work. So I remember early on like wanting things that I saw on TV or like that I saw other kids in the neighborhood with. So I just knew that like you had to work to get it. So I would definitely skip school and get caught trying to get to Foot Locker to get like whatever Jordan release was going on. Right. And But I mean, that was those specific things. I remember like most of my childhood like wearing slip-on bands and having those shoes taken away from me because the soles were falling off but like and those things are still with me today like I wear things to death yeah. you know I have a great rotation of things thank God but like I wear things until they fall apart I right. appreciate every moment with them right yeah and then recently you know the sneaker and fashion world have met in a way that they haven't before mm -hmm. right especially if you look at a brand like Adidas that releases collaborations they did Rick Owens they do Raph, o um, Raph Simmons now and you know they've done Y3 with Yoji for such a long time how do you guys think that changed, um, one, like the fact that there's always been sneakerheads who have been pre appreciated fashion, and then people in fashion that like sneakers, but you know the two were sort of in separate worlds? I think for brands like Adidas to do products with things, people like Rick Owens or Raph Simmons, I think that's also bridging that gap, right. you know, um, people who may not know, you know, there's a lot of people who don't know about sneakers or right. the sneaker culture, and maybe that's the way that they found it, you know, um, but I think it also just really opens up a bigger channel for more people to get involved and feel comfortable, you know, they may not relate to Jordans, but they can relate to Raph Simmons because they live in Antwerp and mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Right. Um, something, yeah. Matthew? I think it's great to always see someone's interpretation of what they think a classic is, like, yeah. you know, what Raph does with his Dan Smiths and what Rick did with his, uh, his runner version. So it's great that we have those things. Um, and it just opens up a whole new dialogue and it keeps things interesting because sometimes when you look at the same things over and over again, you lose like mm -hmm. your appreciation for them. But sometimes seeing these new versions of these classics, you love them, and then you start to appreciate the classics even more too. Danny? Yeah, I mean, it's just like widening the conversation of what fashion is. And I know like in food culture, I mean, I don't, I'm not really from the fashion world, but I know like in the food world, it's like things can get really stagnant. Right. You know, and, and I'm sure like in fashion, everything is just like very like, oh, I've seen that, like what's next, what's next? So I think that, like, kind of the fact that, it, like, people are, you know, becoming more accepting to, like, I think there's a new guard. And I think that it's, for like, sure. that, like, sneakers being involved in that, um, it's, it's just better for everything and for everyone. Well, you bring up a great point, too, because I wanted to talk about the parallels in what's happening in food culture and what's happening in sneaker and fashion culture, right? Where, you know, you have two things that are very community and collaboration oriented and uh, it is a lot about reinventing the classics yeah you know in a food you're seeing that with different types of cuisines meeting or people taking a different view on something like cod yeah but in the sneaker and luxury world you see that interplay in like classic silhouettes right where you'll see um, I'm Celine with under Phoebe Philo mm -hmm. took you know an Air Force One silhouette and made it into a luxury sneaker um, 
so going into that and like these sort of not not like the knockoff bootleg versions, but these sort of upscale reimaginings, right? Is that more a testament to the impact of sneaker culture, or is it just like these things have become classic silhouettes in the same way that you know you can't reinvent a white tee, but you can make a better version of it? I mean, all the inspo comes from the streets, <laughs> right? Um, so. If you're going to do a sneaker, then you should do all your research. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, with, in approaching a Jordan S, you know, like the St. Laurent or, you know, Phoebe and Air Force, you know, it's whatever gang you're rolling with. I definitely bought two pair, three pairs of the Celine ones because I love Phoebe and, you know, just everything she stands for for women. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I was definitely there to support. So I have the... OG Air Force that I always buy, and then I have like my high-end one that I'll like break out every now and then. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, I too, since I have a smaller foot, was able to get those Celine sneakers <laughs> in all the colors. Yeah. Um, I think it's great, um, but there's a little part of me that kind of feels indifferent about it because um, I think like maybe when we first started working together at Complex, there was this whole thing where like. Um, brand, luxury brands really decided to dive into the sneaker market. And I thought it was really interesting because it was territory that they never wanted to encroach upon, and I thought it was really great. Um, and I say all that to say I don't feel like every luxury brand needs to make a sneaker because mm -hmm. the, I think there's ideas there, and I think it's great that they're developing ideas, mm -hmm. but um, sometimes the execution is just not great, it's not needed, and we have this whole thing called global warming and pollution. <laughs> yeah. So I've started calling some of these designer collaborations and these sneakers like pollution because if you think about it, no one's buying them, mm -hmm. the material's wasted. Mm -hmm. It starts a whole new dialogue, like why do you need to make this shoe? If you're really great at making clothes, like let someone that makes really great shoes do the shoes for you, this way you just like are. Okay, I have a question. What the? What if, what if it's a room full of them and they're like, these are hot, when they hit the market, they're going to, you know, sell well, out? Well, I mean, that's going to be any industry. I'm sure there's like a room <laughs> full of people that are in a room when you were doing a tasting and they say it tastes amazing and right. then you find out later the general right. public doesn't agree with you. But I, right. I just feel like it's like, not, not you personally. <laughs> no, but not but you personally. Maybe. But, but then like, they make seven different colorways after that. Exactly. And, and it's like, yeah. you know, those things you see them on all the, uh, the, the outlet, right, outlet right. sites yeah, and the discount yeah, yeah. sites. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I, I shop those too. <laughs> um, but I just, I just feel like sometimes for me, it's like this weird thing where it's like, I can really appreciate them wanting to be a part of the right. culture, I guess you can say, but at the same time, it's like not necessary for everyone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Also, why don't they just ask the, the people who do brand, it? Well, right? Right. Yeah, you know, uh, the Nike or the Jordan. Yeah, a Lely sneaker sell out in less than thirty seconds. <laughs> True. I know this. I had a buy, <laughs> but I'm saying you because, like, you know, she's she's somebody that I'm sure you know would consult with the brand that she aligns with to make them the perfect sneaker that right. will sell, since her product does sell. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I just feel like there needs to be more collaboration in that way, smart thinking, instead of right. like right. wasting all this time and resources and just mm -hmm. like making mm -hmm. the planet a more dirty. Yeah. Well, are there any you know designer labels that make? footwear and make sneakers that, you know, you still gravitate towards? Like, you know, what does it take now that there's a lot of product out there and we all have probably too many sneakers, mm. but we're not gonna, never going to let them go? Yeah. But, um, you know, I still get excited about product. I know all you guys still get excited about product in some way, shape, or For form. Sure. What excites you about a shoe now where you're like, I have to have that? Mm, different. Uh, different different reasons. Sometimes it could be the person who's collaborating on it. Sometimes it could be the colorway that I've never seen or came back out and I wasn't able to get as a young girl. Um, I think most of it just kind of starts from what did you like when you were a kid? Right. And then it's like, what can you have now that you didn't get? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's definitely it because I think a lot of the stuff that I buy now really ties back to me as a kid, things yeah. I couldn't get and things I wanted um, and things that I normally wore because I used to always wear like red slip-on Vans mm -hmm. um, and I just recently bought um, that Fear of God slip-on so it looks like okay, it looks like okay. a, you know, just a nice yeah, yeah, yeah. casual Vans type sneaker right. but it's like completely slip-on mm -hmm. and I also wear a lot of Uggs, I don't, I'm not afraid to admit <laughs> that. But yeah, it, and and like the fact that I can just put my foot in it and have the rest right. free, like something Cozy. about it really makes me remind me of my childhood. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know. I feel like as a chef, like it's hard because it's like, you know, it, you chefs are obsessive. No, no. I, 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 you know, I don't wear crops. I, I did at one point. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a pair. They're really great because they're non-slip. But um, but like, 
I think yeah, I have to be careful because it's a, fashion is a slippery slope. And right. It's like what we're all talking about is like when we couldn't afford it, and I still probably can't afford a lot of things. Like like I should not be buying shoes and like. But as a chef, I'm like obsessive, and like there was a point in my life where I had to have this thing, and it was too. It was not even. I had to stop for a second and be like, why do I even want this? Like, right. what is this fulfilling in me? And um, so I think with fashion, especially. It's really fun. It's like it's cool. It's just about how you rock it. A also B like, do you really need it? And like, I really appreciate your thought on like, on global warming and like people just producing things. And with technology now and like, the internet, it's like, with food, I can see it too. It's mm -hmm. just something's hot. Like now, it's like it's like acai is like the cool thing. And then right. it's like, and then they make all this stuff around it. And you see all these acai bowls, pl bowl places open up and then close in New York. I mean, pokey spots. Even yeah. Korean fried chicken was a thing at one point. And so, like, you know, I think it's really important to be attentive to the impact that fashion has yeah. on the planet. Mm -hmm. Well, what about, like, you know, the collector mindset that's mm -hmm. prevalent in a lot of sneaker people and also people that like fashion? And, you know, I mean, for me, it's like a, a, the Prada cloud busts, right? It's like they have the first release with the strap and then they had the lace version. And I'm like, well, now I need a pair of the one with the laces, right. you know? So is that still a mentality you still adhere to when you find something that, you know, really works and you're like, I'm gonna get as many colors as I can because this is like my new rotation for the time being. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely guilty. Um, you know, it could be just like an off, it could be mostly this, I bought two Celine boots, they're duck boots and they're all black, but then the other one was black with olive and I'm like, well, this could be for next year, right. next winter, and then, you know, the year after that, we could wear both of them. I don't know. You know, it's mm -hmm. my three-year plan with Celine, but, yeah. <laughs> um, but it the works. I, I just feel like because I know I'm going to really love these shoes later on and it's never going to go away, that's right. why I have to have it. For sure. Yeah, yeah. I, definitely, I definitely get several pairs of the same thing because my style and taste level doesn't change much. My color palette doesn't change much, so I know that... <laughs> Whether it's sitting there for three months or three years, it's gonna get worn. Yeah. So I don't really have that problem, and also I'm like pretty conscious of like how I shop and mm -hmm. right. how I move things around when I'm done with them. So yeah, I, I definitely and I definitely think it's 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 smart because at at some point your life becomes like really busy with all the things that you're doing. If you have this like language with yourself where you know you can wake wake up in the morning and throw on these three things and feel confident about yourself or feel like you can leave the house and be presentable, that's that's kind of like the goal. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. for sure. I hate to think about getting yeah. dressed. Yeah, Danny, what about you? Um, I, like I said, I used to have, like, two of the same shoes sometimes. Like, oh, these should be nice, and then I'll wear these just every day. And, and like, now I'm a lot more selective about, um, what I get. And, yeah, if it's, like, something crazy. Like, there's, I was very proud of myself, because recently I went to the store, and, um, I actually tried the shoe on, and then I was like, well, and I looked at it, and I was like, no, I'm not going to try it on. Because I know, you know, if you try it on, you're probably going to get it. Right. Pretty much. And so I was like, <laughs> put them on, that, then I tried them on. I was like, no, if I go home and think about it, then I'll... I feel like it's my dad right now. But my dad would have told me as a kid. But um, and then I went back a second time. Then I went back a third time, and then I got them. So I'm a lot more like cautious about how um, how much of what I get I get. Right. And I also have a five year old son, and it's so fun to kind of like I'm really careful about that too. Not trying to live vicarious. Like his first pair of shoes were like Jordan Concords. Like it's insane. <laughs> like because when they're that small, like they're like fifty bucks. Yeah. yeah. Do you find yourself? shopping more for your kid about like stuff that you would buy for yourself but you can excuse it because kind of, it's I mean, not like, for you yeah my son, yeah in a weird way we it's not this shirt but like we do fit in the same like size clothing sometimes so, right like, i'll buy like a small shirt <laughs> Wait, how does that work i like it's like baby tees are small and he's actually big like, <laughs> okay. he's like he's like okay. that. but like you know like we'll share like at house a lot of like baby tees and oh. stuff like that and it, and it just looks you know like so i do kind of look at it that way i'm like oh well we can both wear this, you know, but like, right. but I do, but yeah, it's fun to like, but I'm also conscientious of that too, because I, I remember like, my first job also was I was like, I was like 13, and um, I really had to work for a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. like, I wanted to get cool stuff, I remember when I was 18, I worked at Abercrombie and Fitch, because I like, yeah. had like 90 layers of clothing on at one time, you know what I mean, and for like, sure. so I want to like, instill those values in my son as well, and I don't, I, I, I didn't grow up having everything, and if we could have, I don't know if my parents would have gotten it, right. so. Well, the last question, I have to call you out for not wearing sneakers to a sneaker uh, panel. <laughs> but, you know, at the same time, I feel like since we're talking about sneakers in the luxury market, you know, buying expensive sneakers, at least for me, it was a gateway to being like, okay, well, if I want $500 shoes, right. I should also at least have a nice pair of loafers or, you know, some nice 
hard bottoms that I can wear when I'm not wearing sneakers. Mm -hmm. So in that way, was like uh, getting into high-end sneakers a gateway into exploring other sort of luxury fo footwear for you guys? I feel like... I've always wanted to have both in my closet. Mm -hmm. Definitely always been sneaker heavy, but I always wanted like a cute pair of booties or a nice like strappy heel. Right. But I feel like it's like purses, you know? You're like, is this gonna go? Like, is it gonna go with 10 outfits mm -hmm. or one, you know? It's Am like, I this wasting is the last money? Thing I'm gonna buy, or... but that's a lie. Right, right. right. Um, I think I'm very particular with like different styles mm -hmm. and stuff. It's but I mean, it's also how I treat my sneakers. So I feel like if I have the best sneaker game, then I need to have the best hill game or the best boot game. Right. Um, but yeah. Cool. What about you, Matthew? Um, I primarily wear sneakers. I think if my closet was broken down, I'd be like 70% sneakers, 30% shoes or all, whatever alternative category. But the ones that I do have, are they all hit like they're the good right. version right. of right. that shoe. Right. So, I mean, I feel like I'm fine. Like, when I get dressed, I know I have a go-to shoe, but it gets weird sometimes because I wear them down so much. I look kind of crazy in a suit and a really worn down shoe. So, yeah. 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 It could be a vibe, though. It's actually not a vibe. GQ. Yeah. Thanks so much to our panelists for uh, joining us, and thanks to Matches Fashion for hosting Thank you. Us. Thank you. <laughs>